over the next several weeks, we're going to be exploring the idea of love languages. There are five love languages. The first of which is quality time. Peoples whose love language is quality time feel the most adored when another person actively wants to spend time with them. They particularly love it when there's active listening and eye contact, full presence. This love language is all about giving your undivided attention to that person without the distractions of telephones, phone screens, television. They have a strong desire to actively spend time and have meaningful conversations or share in activities. The next love language is service. If your love language is acts of service, you value when another person goes out of their way to make your life easier. Things like bringing you soup when you're sick, making you coffee in the morning, picking up your dry cleaning when you've had a busy day at work. This love language is for people who believe that actions speak louder than words. Unlike those who prefer to hear how much they're cared for, people on this list like to be shown how they're appreciated, doing the smaller and bigger chores to make their lives easier and more comfortable is highly cherished by these people. Next is physical touch. People with physical touch as their love language feel loved when they receive physical signs of affection, kissing, holding hands, cuddling, and intimacy. Physical intimacy and touch can be incredibly affirming and serve as a powerful emotional connector for people with this love language. The roots go back to our childhood, where some people only felt deep affection and love by their caretakers when they were held or kissed or touched. People who communicate their appreciation through this language, when they consent to it, feel appreciated when they're hugged or touched. They value the feeling of warmth and comfort that comes with touch. Next is words of affirmation. People who value words of affirmation as a love language appreciate verbal acknowledgments of affection, including frequent I love you's, compliments, words of appreciation, and often frequent digital communication like texting or social media engagement. These expressions make them feel understood and appreciated. Next is gifts. Gifts is a pretty straightforward love language. You feel loved when people give you visual symbols of love. It's not about the monetary value, but the symbolic thought behind them. People with this style recognize and value the gift-giving process, the careful reflection, the deliberate choosing of the object to represent the relationship, and the emotional benefits from receiving the present. People whose love language is receiving gifts enjoy being gifted something that is meaningful. The key is to give meaningful things that matter to them, reflect their values, not necessarily those of the giver. Do you measure?
Good morning and welcome to David's United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We have several announcements this morning. Throughout the month of February, we will be receiving a special offering for Canal Winchester Human Services Food Pantry, which provides a number of much-needed services to those in need in our community here in Canal Winchester. So we invite you to either give through David's UCC or directly to Canal Winchester Human Services in support of the food pantry in this month of February. There are many opportunities for children and youth uh, throughout the month. The schedule for these events is included in your Thursday and Sunday emails from the church. If you'd like more information, please contact Brenda Francis, our Minister for Children and Youth, for more information. Our Lent devotionals are now available in the church office for $5 apiece. Uh, you can pick one up in the church office from Monday to Thursday between the office hours of 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Our Dare to Dream Lenten study is going on now. Uh, the books for the Dare to Dream book by Mike Slaughter are also available in the church office for $5 a piece during office hours. We meet Monday evenings at 7 p.m. via Zoom, so please uh, join us for a wonderful discussion, and the Zoom link for those is in your weekly emails. Easter is coming upon us soon on April 4th, so it is time to order your Easter flowers. We will have, in addition to lilies, tulips, daffodils, and begonias available to honor a special person in your life or to remember someone who has passed on within this community. Uh, you may sponsor flowers for $7 a piece. If you would like to order flowers for Easter, please contact the church office by email or by phone uh, with the number of flowers you would like and the name of those that you are honoring. And we are conducting a March Madness fundraiser in support of our David's UCC kids. The funds raised will go to our Sunday School Holy Moly program and to David's extended care. So we are asking folks to donate homemade snacks, either savory or sweet, and we will be offering pre-orders for those. So please register to um, make goods for that by March 5th. And we will have those available for sale and pick up on March 18th and 19th. So check your emails for more information about that or contact the office to sign up. Hi, everybody. I have a question for you. Why do people give gifts? Think about that. And now I also want you to think about what's the best gift you ever got. I bet that person that gave that gift to you knew how much you would love that special gift and how much it would mean to you. They really loved you, didn't they? Well, there was a woman back in Jesus's day when he was here on earth and she loved Jesus so much she wanted to give him a very special gift. So the best gift that she could think of was some very, very expensive perfume. So she took this very expensive perfume and she opened the jar and poured oil of this perfume all over his head. And the reason she did that was because back in Jesus's time, they anointed kings with oil. So it was her way of saying Jesus was a king and she was so happy and loved him so much that she cried and wiped her tears with her hair and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, there were some people at this party that Jesus was at that thought that she should not have given him this gift, that it was too expensive, 
that the money should have gone to the poor or been spent in some other way. But Jesus knew the woman's heart and how happy she was and how she wanted to show her love for him. And he said that this was a wonderful gift. God wants us to give everyone we know gifts just like the woman gave Jesus, a gift of abundance. And the word abundance, that means there's plenty to go around, enough for everybody with lots of extras so that we don't have to be stingy and hold things close to our heart, but just give as much as we can. So in this coming week, I want you to think about that, about the best gift that you've been given and how you can give special gifts to other people because you love them. Thank you. I'm reading from Mark chapter 14, verses 3 through 9. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them anytime you want but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As many of you know, I spent over a decade working in fundraising for large national organizations and educational institutions. I did the research determining what donors would be interested in supporting and how much they could afford to give to a certain project. I was able to be a part of six, seven, and eight-figure gifts from some of our country's most prominent philanthropists and was part of the team that secured an $80 million gift to the School of Public Health at the George Washington University. It was often a strange world to be a part of, especially since I grew up a very working class family. I saw firsthand how some people sought to use their wealth for access to power and prestige or to redeem themselves and to assuage guilt. But at least they were using their abundance to educate first generation college students or provide access to clean drinking water around the world. But the donor projects I most loved working on were the ones where the donor clearly loved children or the environment or history. Their gifts were pure gifts out of passion for a project or the organization. As we look at the love language of receiving gifts, I think of those givers, and not just the multimillionaires whose names are well known, but also the everyday people who faithfully sent in their $25 checks because they loved the mission of the organization. There is a legendary philanthropist named Chuck Feeney. I never worked on a project involving him, which is why I can tell you his story. Mr. Feeney is a 90-year-old Irish-American businessman. If you have ever shopped at a duty-free store in an airport, that's how he made his wealth. Unlike most philanthropists who often save a lot of their wealth to establish a foundation after they die or save the big gifts for very late, he decided that he wanted to give away 
absolutely everything, his entire fortune while still living. He gave all of his shares in his company to Atlantic Philanthropies, which he established to make his private gifts. For many years, organizations receiving his gifts were required not to reveal him as their source. Unlike many who want their names on buildings, he declined the spotlight. He has said, I cannot think of a more personally rewarding and appropriate use of wealth than to give while one is still living, to personally devote oneself to meaningful efforts to improve the human condition. More importantly, today's needs are so great and varied that intelligent philanthropic support and positive interventions can have greater value and impact today than if they are delayed when the needs are greater. He has managed to give $8 billion over his lifetime. And last September, Atlantic Philanthropies shuddered, having given away the last of his fortune. And Mr. Feeney lives simply in a rented apartment, living off of a small nest egg. But there are plenty of critics of folks like Chuck Feeney saying their giving is too extravagant, or who suggests that he and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and others are simply trying to control the organizations that they give so generously to. Those people would find their doppelgangers in today's scripture lesson. All four of the Gospels tell this story with varying details. Jesus and his disciples are in Bethany, two miles outside of Jerusalem. Jesus had friends in Bethany, and here he is having dinner in the home of Simon the leper. And all we know about this man is his name. But Mark tells us that it is two days before Passover. In just a few days, Jesus will be crucified. But for now, Jesus spends time with his friends. In the midst of this, an unnamed woman comes to the table with a jar of expensive fragrant oil. She breaks open the jar and anoints Jesus' head with this expensive perfume known as spikenard. Immediately, others there criticize this unnamed woman for this extravagant gift to her Lord. In John's telling of this event, he names Judas, who will soon betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, as one of these critics. And they say, why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus receives gratefully what this beloved woman has done for him. He responds to those critiquing this act by saying, let her alone, why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me, for you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body before its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. And that is true. For though we do not know this woman's name, we know what she did, and we know the gift she gave to Jesus. The others present there likely did not understand or foresee the events that would soon follow in Jerusalem. But Jesus did and received gratefully this anointing by this woman who gave out of her pure love for Christ. Princeton professor Clifton Black writes, Rare is the philanthropist who refuses credit for the foundation she has established or for the buildings he has funded. Mark upsets the way its listeners evaluate fame. Bethany's most generous of women is forever remembered, although she remains anonymous. She was an object of scorn, not because she was presumed disreputable, but because of the wealth her onlookers believed her to have squandered. 
The estimated value of her bomb would have covered a day laborer's wages for nearly a full year. Defending this woman's gift, Jesus interprets all she has done for him, anticipating his burial, a beautiful thing that will endure in memory. Once again, we see how very biblical our love language is. Jesus Christ received this gift, perhaps the last gift he received in his earthly life, with gratitude. He saw and acknowledged the love and care with which the woman gave him the ointment and anointed him with it. God in Christ not only receives our gifts and offerings of praise, adoration, and service, but God speaks our love language of receiving gifts, for God is the ultimate gift giver. In the letter of James, possibly written by Jesus' brother, we hear every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the creator of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of God's own purpose, God gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would become a first fruit of his creation. But God's ultimate gift to us is really the gift of God's self through Jesus Christ. God loves us so much, God comes to be one of us to teach us to love in the same way which God loves. And though it has often been misused by fundamentalists, I still believe that John 3.16 says it most clearly. For God so loved the world that God gave His only Son, that everyone who believes in Him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. This is God's great love for us, and there is no greater gift. Gary Chapman says, Throughout human history, God has revealed Himself as the one who loves those who will acknowledge him. God, in turn, expresses God's love by giving gifts. Sometimes those gifts are material things that can be touched and tasted, such as food, clothing, and shelter. Other times, God's gifts are in the realm of the spiritual, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, peace of mind, and purpose in life. Now, some like those critics when the woman poured her gift and anointed Jesus, might want to critique those whose love language is receiving gifts as being spendthrifts or being materialistic. But that is not a fair assessment of this love language. Many of us are visual learners. We have to be able to visualize something to understand it. Those whose love language is receiving gifts are like that. Gifts are simply visible symbols of love and care of a spouse, friend, child, or someone else important to us. They show a person that their loved one has lovingly chosen or created this item with them only in mind. It is not about expensive or extravagant gifts, but the love with which the gift is given. In the five love languages, Gary Chapman reminds us that such gifts can be as simple as a handmade card on a scrap of paper or or picking a wildflower. How many of us as children picked flowers in our yards to show our love to our mothers? One of my closest friends loves listening to the local NPR station and records much of their programming. He'll often burn CDs for me or other friends of programs he knows will enjoy. I have a little binder of programs that he has given me over the years. It's an inexpensive gift, but whenever I receive one, I know that he has been thinking of me and my interests and the things that we share and spent the time and consideration on that token of acknowledgement. Receiving gifts is quite central to how we experience love. In Scottish culture, a quaich is a silver two-handed bowl given at birthdays, weddings, and other celebrations. 
And a few years ago, I gave my dear friend Evie one on her 35th birthday. I remember, too, officiating a few years ago at a Filipino and Cambodian wedding, which had an elaborate gift exchange ritual from both cultures. Even in our own United Church of Christ marriage liturgy, the prayer before the giving of rings says, by these symbols of covenant promise, gracious God, remind these two of your encircling love and unending faithfulness that in all their life together they may, they may know joy and peace with one another. As the rings are given, the ones to be married say, I give you this ring as a sign of my love and faithfulness. We experience love in receiving gifts, not because we desire more stuff, but because they are visible reminders of the love of another person. Whenever we look upon that gift, whether it's a wedding ring or a simple card your grandmother sent to you years ago, we remember that love and thoughtfulness. The church, of course, is a recipient of many gifts. We receive gratefully our congregation's gifts of time and dedication, talents and skills and financial support. Just as you pledge these things out of your love and commitment to David's United Church of Christ, we receive them with love and care and pledge to use them to further the kingdom of God and share the love of Christ. Your gifts quite literally not only sustain this congregation, but allow us to thrive and flourish. Just a few months ago, the endowment fund received a generous gift from the estate of Bob and Isla Hart. Many of you knew Bob and Isla and experienced firsthand the generous way in which they demonstrated their love of this place. Bob showed love of God and humanity as he was instrumental in developing the David's Way community. And now the Hart's legacy will continue in perpetuity with their gifts that will support mission and outreach here and abroad. Your gifts, too, are transformational and empower us to change lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The giving and receiving of gifts is central to how we experience and express love. It is central to how God demonstrates God's love for us. And it is central to how we express our love and care for this community of faith. As we remember that every good gift comes from above, may we be faithful stewards of all the gifts that God has given us. This day and every day, may we make God's love visible as we share that love with our gifts. To God be the glory. Amen.
Let us pray. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Your gift of grace is for all people. Give confident faith to all the baptized that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. All the ends of the earth worship you. From galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Hear us, O God. In Jesus, you joined humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We await the day of Christ's coming in glory. Lead us by the example of all the saints whom you have called to take up their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I pray that this service has been a blessing to you this day. And I invite you to share your gifts of love to support this community of David's United Church of Christ as we seek to share the love of Christ with the entire world. So please give whatever way you are able, either online through our website or the Tithely app, through bank bill pay with your financial institution, or sending your check to the church. Any way you give, we greatly appreciate your faithful stewardship and showing your love and commitment to this community of faith. So receive now this benediction. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for gifts of life for gifts of love and joy, for gifts of comfort and mercy, for gifts of patience and serenity, for gifts of healing and hope. Help us to be loving stewards of your gifts and to be as generous to others as you are to us. So may we go forward in the name of God, our Creator, and Christ, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Advocate. Amen.